Dr. Ray, we know from the Arizona case, the Supreme Court said that uh, state local law enforcement were not to enforce immigration laws, but isn't it true that local and state law enforcement officers can enforce state and local law if, uh, even if the, uh, the defendant is uh, in the country illegally? Well, I want to be a little bit careful since I, uh, the last time I looked at that issue was back in the uh, 2001, 2003 range when I was a, a lawyer at the Justice Department. But Look, my, recollection my time is, is very similar. short. My it's an easy question. To yours. My, my recollection is similar to yours, but I'm yes. not speaking well, as a lawyer right now. Okay, it is the case, and I hope you'll refresh your recollection and your legal training. So uh, it seems that since the federal government is welcoming basically by its tactics, by its handling of the massive surge across our border um, in such a way to continue to encourage it that uh, uh, there is massive destruction to landowners' property. It sounds like understanding the criminal trespass laws of Texas that perhaps landowners on the border ought to have no trespassing signs, including in Spanish so that local law enforcement can protect the country um, while they're protecting local property owners. Uh, there was a question about uh, also the, um, the FISA court, and I'm still, as a former judge, particularly disturbed that no FISA judge um, felt strongly enough about uh, people not lying in applications for warrants that they took action for contempt of court, but should DOJ officials that sign applications for warrants before the FISA court actually read them before they certify that they're true and correct? Um, certainly it's my practice when, I, when as FBI director, I'm signing applications to- You do read, read them. them. I do review them, yes, absolutely. And I would commend you for that, and I would ask you to look in- They're not short. <laughs> by the way. Yeah, they're yeah. usually lengthy. Yeah. But I would uh, commend your looking into uh, Mr. Rosenstein's uh, inability to uh, testify that he uh, actually read those uh, regarding the Trump campaign before he signed them. Um, the night before January 6th, January 5th, that evening I was talking to Capitol Police officers and I said, you know, let's face it, uh, most of the conservatives that come, they don't have any intention of being violent. And they said, well, we've been briefed today that uh, there's a good bit of, uh, as I understood, online activity, that there are people that are gonna be coming that hate Trump, but they're gonna dress up in red, MAGA, Trump, paraphernalia to try to blend in and create trouble. Um, we had Capitol Police Chief Sun testify that uh, they got no information from U.S. Intel or from the DOJ, FBI, of any threat of the nature that came about. Did the FBI have information about the violent threat that occurred on January 6th, on January 5th? Well, the answer to that is complicated, unfortunately. So we have the, we've already talked about a little bit here this morning. It shouldn't be complicated. You either had information or you didn't. That was my question. Different, so there's different kinds of information. We had the online chatter that we just talked about and the Norfolk, so-called Norfolk SIR, Situational Information Report has that. But what we did not have, to my did knowledge. Did you pass any of that information on to Chief uh, Sund? We passed the Norfolk information onto the Capitol Police in three different ways, uh, as well as to- Okay, MPD. well you were careful to note that most of the protesters who were left this last summer uh, were basically peaceful, but you haven't said that about the 100, 200,000 people that showed up on January 6th. Do you know how many people actually came into the Capitol on January 6th uh, that were unauthorized? 
I don't have an exact number. I do know that we've uh, now uh, are approaching around 500 arrests. But to be clear, to your point about peaceful, the way I, th I think is a fair description of January 6th is there's sort of three groups of people, almost like an inverse pyramid. First group, biggest number of people who showed up kind of outside, maybe not on the Capitol grounds, uh, were peaceful, maybe rowdy, but peaceful protesters. Then there's a second group that were people who, uh, for whatever reason, engaged in, let's say, the next level of criminal conduct, trespass, et cetera. Uh, and that is criminal, that is a violation, and it needs, those laws need to be enforced. And then there's the third group, uh, which is where you're seeing a lot of the arrests and a lot of the more significant charges that are coming out of our work right now, which are the people who brought all sorts of weapons, uh, you know, Kevlar, tactical vests, uh, you know, bear spray. Firearms? What's that? Anybody bring yeah, yeah, firearms? We, Gentlemen. Uh, do we have, I can think of at least one instance where there was an individual with a gun inside the Capitol, but for the most part, the weapons were weapons other than firearms. But General there's three groups, and it's hard to paint with one broad brush every single individual. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Cohen.